Okay, so uh, I have been tasked with giving a lecture on minority leadership um, in a revolutionary movement. And basically I'm going to talk about uh, two big things. Um, the two things are basically uh, a sort of atmosphere that is created within an organization or movement, and then also the sorts of skills that are necessary to be developed. So to put it quite simply, the only way to build minority leadership uh, within the revolutionary movement is to give minorities leadership within the revolutionary movement. And so my entire discussion will be simply about the best, or at least the most effective ways I have found of actually building that minority leadership, um, concretely and also the principles behind those. So the first thing to keep in mind is the principles by which one can build or, or, or need to build uh, minority leadership. Uh, the first is equality, uh, the second is respect, and the third is responsibility. For equality, uh, it should be recognized that there is equality among perspectives. This is something that is often lost um, because quite frequently the dominant perspective um, is held um, above minority perspectives. Um, it's easy to talk about the Western world starting, um, you know, or, or the, the history of the world starting with the Western world. And it's easy to talk about the history of a revolutionary movement and name off a bunch of dead white men. Um, but it's important to note that there are other revolutionary tendencies, there are other revolutionary perspectives, and that those minority views should be given equality within the actual movement. And that perspectives not be dismissed out of hand. And that's going, that is a very essential part of equality, is that various perspectives, various positions, um, various ideas be given equal treatment and not simply dismissed. But it's more than simply not being dismissed. It also means allowing minorities uh, to have an equal ability to voice opinions. Now, this is not simply everyone can raise their hand, uh, and so minorities, you know, can uh, you know should raise their or have are granted the formal ability to raise their hands above other people. It also entails that certain uh, things be recognized, not the least of which. Um, although we're certainly going to change it here, uh, the dominant mode or the dominant voice is going to be a white male perspective. And a white male perspective, um, again, I would like to point out, is uh, at least equalized, if not diminishing, in this group. Um, it's very difficult for a minority perspective uh, to be raised. It's very difficult for a woman to raise her hand in a group of men um, and talk about an issue that will be controversial among most men, such as uh, racism, or not so much as racism, uh, such as sexism within the movement. Um, also, in, in addition, and I'll get to this later, um, also the sort of ways in which minorities are treated. That is a very difficult, very extraordinarily difficult uh, thing to raise, especially when the majority uh, have no experience with it. Um, when the majority are male, uh, they don't have the experience of having sexist discrimination. When the majority is white, they don't have the, uh, the experience of being discriminated against. And if um, the majority is heterosexual, they don't have any experience with heteronormativity or those forms of discrimination. Um, as far as this revolutionary movement um, that we're a part of, classism is not a huge issue, which is good. Um, in other movements, perhaps classism is an issue, but generally speaking, those are just activist movements. When you're talking about a revolutionary movement, by and large, the preference and predilection is towards working class people. And in fact, there's an alternate danger in that respect, which I'll get to in just a little bit. Um, but again, it's absolutely vital uh, that minorities be allowed to voice their opinion 
and have n and don't necessarily, uh, you know, have to do so to a hostile crowd. I'm sure every single one of us has been in a position, or in our classroom, or in a meeting, in which a minority, uh, either a racial minority, an ethnic minority, um, a uh, the, the term is somewhat a, a misnomer, right? But um, uh, female or, sec or uh, gender or uh, sexual minority or someone who is female raises their hand, expresses a view that is not shared by the dominant group, and then it very quickly goes around the room of all the people criticizing this particular view. Um, not necessarily, and, and this is the important thing, not necessarily out of a uh, disagreement with the position or a critical analysis of the position, but rather as something dismissive. Um, I think we should have, I, I've heard this, you know, I'm not, it, it's not important what this, the, the issue is, uh, but they say, I think we should do this as a plan of action. And then three or four hands go up of white males, predominantly, who are like, no, I don't think we need to do that because it's X. And then another white male, I don't think we need to do that because it's Y. I don't think we need to do that because it's Z. Um, and these were actually all directed towards the experience I'm thinking of, were all directed towards a female. And rather than have anyone raise their hand uh, and say, well, I mean, why would, you, why would you want to do that? What do you think will be gained by that? What do you think the dangers of that are? Right? There was an immediate critical response. And if there's simply an immediate critical response, if we want to build a revolutionary movement, we need to become conscious of these immediate, widespread critical responses. And if we begin to see these, and especially if they break down among gender lines, especially if they break down around sexual lines or sexuality, especially if they break down among racial lines, to build leadership, it is important to help give that person a voice to speak with. Rather than criticizing, even if you disagree, or perhaps even especially if you disagree, to ask what it is they think that will accomplish, and then to critically analyze their response, rather than joining the growing circle of critique. So, that's about giving uh, minorities equal ability to voice opinion. The final uh, part, our principle of equality, also recognizing uh, entails recognizing that groups have a position of privilege. Until someone talks to me or I open my mouth, everyone assumes that I'm a dumb spick. All the time. And in fact, it's very difficult for people who have entrenched racism. And ironically, the entrenched racism doesn't usually come from just working class people. Um, as a matter of fact, usually once I'm speaking to working class people, uh, very quickly they catch that I, I know what I'm talking about, or at least I'm incredibly educated, and those are two different things. Um, and so generally, uh, uh, the racial position goes out. The most difficulty I have personally found is talking to white academics. White academics and white middle and upper class people. And the reason why is because of the color of my skin, they are expecting a certain response on a certain sort of tone, and they don't get it. As a side note, I do have a privilege, which is I am a man. And this is a privilege. And when I speak, men listen to me more than they listen to women. A woman can literally be saying the exact same thing, literally word for word, that I am saying and I will be listened to, and she will be dismissed. For example, I was working within an organization, and there was a question on what exactly the organization was going to be doing at the next meeting. On Facebook, a woman posted what it was that the organization was going to be doing at the next meeting. And then there was some discussion about that that kind of moved it below the list, and then a, a man literally asked, wait, so what is it we're going to be doing at the next meeting? I literally copied and pasted her response to him, and he said, oh, thanks. 
This did not happen once. This did not happen twice. This did not happen three times or four times or five times. This happened on, I can instantiate, no less than 20 occasions, but rather showed a widespread disregard, just absolute disregard um, for uh, minorities because there was a privilege, privileging, a privileging, an inequality in this respect between men and women. And so it's absolutely vital when talking to someone, when asking information, when evaluating positions, to consider, is there a privilege that is coming with it? Is there a privilege of white? Is there a pri pri privilege of heterosexual? Is there a privilege of male? Is there a privilege of upper class, certain modes of speaking, certain modes of dress? And this is something we should be absolutely conscious of. And it, it's incredibly widespread. Again, what I say is usually not taken immediately or it's taken with much more resistance than when someone who is white says the same thing. But my privilege, and it is a genuine privilege, especially among people of my own race, that the, actually, no, let me strike that not even among people of my own race, especially among people of my own race, because there, are, there is a strong element of patriarchy in Latino and Chicano culture. I have a privilege when I speak as a man to other men where women are present. And so to build minority leadership, it's important to recognize that sort of inequality and that sort of privilege. Now, how does one do that? Notice the statements being uttered. Um, as many of you know, uh, or as many of you here are, public speaking is not necessarily your forte. And so it's very easy for people's words to be confused, the ideas to be confused, for people to speak without it being well formed. Everybody in this room, myself included, has done this before. We all do it. Now, the question is, and you should watch, are minorities, women, people of color, you know, gender and sexual minorities, are they being dismissed as not being able to speak as well when confronted with someone who has this privilege and ostensibly is able to speak well? Just, my, just myself, there has been recently an instance where I have had Someone in the movement who is white behave in a certain way towards another member in the organization. Behave extraordinarily hostile to that person. Over and over and over again. To a greater extent than even I, and I myself am hostile to this person. But they have been hostile to this person extraordinarily larger extent than I have. And yet, the responses garnered by that person are generally speaking polite. They disagree, but they're polite. The responses geared towards me are not. And so, again, this is not a poor, oh, woe is me sort of thing. But if we want to build minority leadership, we need to be conscious of this. Are the actions being taken towards women and people of color proportional to the same instance as those that are being taken towards men? Essentially, but not or mostly, but not essentially, white men. And we should always, always, always be conscious of the interactions that go on in that regard. So again, if we don't afford minorities, uh, afford equality to minority perspectives, if we do not give minorities uh, the ability to have equal voice, a substantive equal voice, not simply a formal equal voice that they can raise their hand, or talk the same number of minutes as everyone else. And if we recognize the inequality and privilege granted to different groups, if we can keep all of these in mind, this will be a good foundation for building, um, uh, sorry, uh, minority leadership in the revolutionary movement. I just realized I have these. I should really write this on the board. Um, the next thing, Beyond that is respect.
sorry, I'm a bad lecturer, which is why I can't comment. Right. The next thing that we need to build, or principle we need to build, is one of respect. Now, um, in order to build a position of respect, uh, what we need is we need to avoid discriminating terms and behaviors. perfectly honest, this is probably the one I have the biggest difficulty with. It's very easy for uh, us to avoid calling people spics, niggers, chains. That's not what's at issue. Usually the, raci uh, the racism or the offensive uh, terms are go more subtly. Um, now, again, we should, be, we should be clear that the terms themselves are not, should never be enough to dissuade someone from the revolutionary movement. But it's about making a comfortable and welcoming environment for them. I would guess probably, except in some sort of comedic fashion or as a slip, most of you have never said the most vile of racial, racial terms. But how often does someone say, um, Immigrant or uh, illegal immigrant. How often has and this is this is one that I actually have managed to avoid because I did it in high school, so I'm now absolutely embarrassed to have ever said this. How many people ever in their uh, life have said that's gay as a pejorative or something stupid? How often have you heard someone say illegal immigrant? How often have you heard someone say gay? and not said anything. Because it's not enough simply to not say it yourself. It's, you also need to engage critically the people who use those terms. Uh, how many times have you heard or said the word bitch? How is it being used? If, you're, you, were, if you were using it negatively, which you almost, for most of us, certainly were, then why is it a negative term? Um, more than that, um, you know, why, for example, uh, I, I mean, you could go through any, any number of examples. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of other ones, but they're not, they're not springing to mind. But, you, I, I mean, there are obviously a bunch of them that I, I just don't try and keep them on hand. But there's also other subtle ways. So, for example, uh, this will be pretty obvious where this is directed. Um, plenty of people belong to ethnic groups. Ethnic groups, particular nations, particular tribes. I myself have no problems being called um, Latino. I think it's dumb. I, I don't think it's particularly accurate, but I don't care. I don't really care if I'm called Hispanic. I don't care. If I'm called a Mexican, I don't care if I'm called Chicano. It doesn't matter to me. But the term of self-identification is important to many people. It's the difference between an Indian and an American Indian, and a member of the First Nations, or a member of the Ogallala, or the Utes, or the Paiutes. Those are different terms, and it goes beyond just that. It's the difference between homosexual, between gay, between queer. All of these terms uh, can carry different connotations. And so in order to avoid discriminating terms and behaviors, it's important to show the respect when, and again, I want to be clear, I'm not by any means perfect on this, but it's important to actually ask what terms people prefer. Um, I have a story of a friend of mine. He was at a party, and he was talking to a white liberal woman. And he was talking about the American Indian struggle, and how the American Indian struggle uh, needed to move forward. And she said, actually, uh, they're called First Nations. <laughs> he himself 
is eligible for benefits on the reservation, right? No, I mean, it's, it's funny how oblivious someone can do, right? Because someone thinks they're helping. Yeah, and thinks they're helping, right? I mean, certainly if you're just saying an American Indian because it means the Indians that were in America as opposed to the Indians that were in India, then yeah, it's an incredibly racially insensitive term. But if you're using American Indian as the term radicalized in the 60s and 70s and was concretely related to the American Indian movement that was fighting for the sovereignty of the tribes, especially the Ogallala tribe, uh, where you literally had open bloody warfare and FBI death squads running through the reservations, rather than American Indian being a term to gloss over the suffering and struggle of you know, the American Indian people or the First, First Nations, it's rather a term of political radicalization. So again, avoiding discriminating terms and behaviors is also another way in which we can build, by being welcoming, um, minority leadership within the movement. This is actually one that I find constantly and it's actually the flip side of equal perspectives and equal voices. Usually, racism or sexism or heterosexism um, or ethnocentrism manifests itself in one of these ways. Respect their position enough to critically analyze it. I hope you can see very clearly how this is the flip side. Um, one is to not <clears throat> grant them equality of their position enough to actually let them have their position and demand that their position conform to whatever it is uh, that you have. But the other is to give a patronizing lack of respect for their position in which they are not critically analyzed. Uh, for those of you who have talked to me, probably for any length of time, you know that I absolutely hate identity politics. And I can give you a whole host of theoretical and practical reasons on why I hate identity politics. But, I will actually critically analyze someone's position, rather than just saying, oh, well, you identified as, um, you know, national liberation, you know, Chicano national liberation, or a gay rights activist or you know, a women's rights activist, or feminist. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I'm, this will probably be embarrassing going on the internet, but I'll stick to my position. Um, most of you here have heard me argue against feminism. You argue against feminism as a position. And my position is, it does a really bad job, and it's Eurocentric, and imperialist, and neo-colonialist, uh, towards the revolutionary struggles of women around the world. And I can make that argument, and it's a really long, complicated argument, and usually it ends up making people angry. But, I respect the position of women's rights activists, and not just women's rights activists, but revolutionaries, because essential to being revolutionary is standing against the domination of women, as it is against standing the domination of all people. I respect the position enough to critically analyze it. I have constantly run into white liberals who will not respect minority opinions. Uh, again, I, I mostly find them in, in respect uh, to, um, to skin color, to race. Um, but the thing that I've noticed is, oh, well, you believe in this? Oh, well, that's probably, it's, it's just your upbringing. You know, you, you probably, you have so many good reasons because you face the racism of our system that, you know, I don't really, I don't necessarily agree, but I, I think your position is, it just makes perfect sense. All that is saying is, I don't care enough to actually engage what you're saying. Let me give you another example. This is why it also doesn't build, uh, this is very antithetical to minority leadership. I was literally in a situation where um, someone who was a minority literally said that they could do whatever they wanted 
uh, because I didn't share their race, and so I can't understand what it's like. And they said, uh, and, and this, this included everything up to getting into fistfights with other activists. And I should accept that because that's their culture. And the fact that I didn't accept their culture of fist fighting meant that you know, I was being Eurocentric. That's incorrect. That itself is a bastardization and a minimization of critical analysis and respect. Because if one actually respects that person or their position, then, as a matter of fact, we can say things that we think about it that are good and things that we think about it that are bad. Um, and so, again, respect is key to understanding uh, and, and, and building minority leadership. Otherwise, there is no leadership. It just collapses into groups doing whatever it is they want to do. Another clear example of this is the LGBTQ community. What are they doing? A lot of times, um, it's about manifestation. Their position is about manifesting themselves as gay. That's fine. And that is, under a lot of contexts, a very revolutionary act. It may not be very revolutionary if you're at, say, the trap, but it is certainly very revolutionary if you're doing it on um, Temple Square. right? And I, I can get behind that. But there are activists who believe and I've heard it multiple times. And you can even look at the Weather Underground. They were doing this exact same sort of thing. Um, that it's a revolutionary activity to just have orgies and just have sex with a lot of people because it breaks bourgeois norms. If I actually respect that position, I will critically analyze it, say what I agree and what I don't agree about it, and give reasonings why. But if I don't actually respect the position, then I'd be like, oh, well, then you're doing your own thing. And that's going to help liberate us all. Which I don't, I don't believe. And I don't think any of you or necessarily believe what everyone else believes on what's going to liberate us. I don't think you believe what I believe is going to lead to a revolutionary movement. Well, how do we get over this, these differences? Well, what we do is we critically analyze others' positions. We find positions of unity that we can both agree on and work on, and we recognize the differences that are real differences between our positions. But that does not help unless we actually analyze each other's positions. The final thing um, is responsibility. And one thing you need to do is encourage responsibility among minorities. Everyone who is interested in the revolutionary movement has a reason for being there. They think that something is wrong with society or something is at least wrong with part of society, and they want to change it. Now, do they necessarily have all the answers? No, because this is about building leadership. Even leaders don't have all the answers. But until you have a leadership, until you have the skills of leadership, you're going to have a very difficult time of it. But they've got some idea of what, is it, what it is they want to do. I had an interaction with someone was like, you know, I'm kind of interested in your organization, and I want to do X, Y, and Z. Do you think that we, as the organization, could do X, Y, and Z? Do you think you could bring that up, that we should do X, Y, and Z? I said, no, but you can. If you really want to do that, why don't you start a committee? Because you can have your own committee, and you could bring these up, and you could be working on these, because it doesn't, I, this is not my particular issue, although I'm willing to work with you on it. And also, you're the one who actually knows what's going on as a minority in this issue. So you should be leading this struggle and make a committee. Now, not every, I, I mean, obviously this is an RSU lecture, um, but I'm, I'm sure at some point someone who's not in the RSU is going to watch this. You don't necessarily have to make a committee for every minority, but you should give them real responsibility. 
Real responsibility means things that need to get done for the organization. Fights that need to be fought for the organization. Uh, flyers that need to be made. Lectures that need to be given. Uh, contacts that need to be set up. These are real responsibilities. And until they have any responsibility, there's no reason to show or believe that they will even have a basic interest in participating in the organization let alone leading the organization. But by experiencing responsibility, they begin to understand what responsibility means, what is required of them out of it, and thus will grow to understand what it means to assign responsibilities to others. And part of leadership is not simply doing it all yourself, but actually understanding responsibility what, and, and giving out that responsibility to see what can actually be done by these people. What is too much for one person? What is not enough for one person? Uh, who has skills where? Who has strengths where? Only by doing the work, only by taking on responsibility yourself. Uh, sorry, I guess it's not yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as though I'm not a minority. But yeah, uh, you know, myself or having, being a, a minority in whatever way and taking it on yourself, that is the only way in which you'll begin to understand it and also begin to move, to work within the revolutionary movement to grow responsibility among the members, which is the most important, one of the most important tasks that leadership can do. Um, finally, for responsibility, uh, and this is again the flip side, the flip side to the uh, are uh, the openly racist organizer who refuses to let any minorities do anything or have any responsibility. The flip side is the overly liberal, condescending attitude which does not hold people responsible. Minorities are not children. Just because someone is a woman does not mean she is not as much of an agent as a man. Just because someone is Latino, Polynesian, African, does not mean they are less intelligent or less of adults than someone who is white. Just because someone is, uh, you know, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, lesbian, queer, that does not mean that they are in any way less adults or less responsible to the organization than a white, rich, heterosexual man. Are they working against greater odds? Yes, absolutely. And we should recognize the inequality in that. But that does not mean they should not be held responsible for what they do. When you do not hold people responsible, you treat them like children. And that is one of the worst things one can do when attempting to build minority leadership. So these are the core principles that I think are necessary to build minority leadership. Uh, they are by no means complete. I actually also have a secondary list um, that, that is more uh, just nuts and bolts, um, which is leadership also entails a certain level of thinking uh, skills, a certain level of emotional skills, and then just a certain level of organizational uh, and social skills. Um, and I get into that later, but let's just stop right here for the moment. Does anyone have questions, objections, fiery responses? I guess one of my questions is a big minority people like, I don't know, I'm not sure of the guy's name, so forgive me, but the blind guy. Oh, Sunjay. Right? What's his name? Sunjay. Sunjay? Yeah. Okay. Well, like, in. I mean, he's obviously part of a minority, a very large minority that is very underrepresented. Um, how do we get like those people within that minority involved and like to delegate tasks in that way? Because again, like in our society, capitalism absolutely hurts these people who are have certain disabilities. Um, so. For those of you who don't know, I, I'm assuming you're referring to the fact that he's blind. Yeah, okay. and of course, like the minority, like people with certain um, capability limits. 
Well, and I, again, I'll be I'll be perfectly uh, perfectly frank, and it's a much easier since he's not here. Um, that that sort of disability in no way, shape, or I mean, it, it does in some ways, uh, you know, make it difficult for him. Uh, but the vast majority of work we do has nothing to do uh, with sight as such. Um, he can speak to people. Uh, he can write things. Um, he can think about things. He can debate things. Um, and I don't. I, what I, I think is we should just look to the things. I, there's a whole vast spectrum of things that someone who has uh, certain physical impairments can do um, that just other people can't. Um, and and so I, I don't actually see that as much of an issue as long as he's not designing our flyers. Um, or, or he could design them but, but be in braille, I, which is fine. But, um, in that particular instance, my concern, uh, and maybe I, I, I should voice this to him, is I actually think he supports capitalism. Um, so that's, I mean, he likes hanging out and he likes, you know, talking to us. Um, but also, you know, he comes from actually a very religious background. He absolutely hates North Korea. Um, and so the, the only reason I haven't push more to like include Sanjay is I actually I think he likes coming and like talking with us and like listening to what we think but I don't think he, I, I, I sorry I mean if somebody wants to prove me wrong I'm more than happy to admit but every, all, every conversation I've had with him and again this goes to respecting their position critically is it has nothing to do with like his sight or you know any linguistic difficulties it's that I, I genuinely think he does support capitalism and so that makes me hesitant to include him more as someone who, like a Tea Party person who shows up, like I'm glad they're here, I'm glad they'll discuss with this, but I'm not, you know, going to be like, oh, here's a responsibility for you, you know, regardless. Did you follow up? I, I wasn't necessarily talking about him as an individual, I was talking about a whole group of people in which, like, deserve to be part of the movement, and maybe they're not for whatever reason. Um, Probably a lot, I would think, because a lot of people um, within like special education, let's cushion it that way, like they're not being taught to like, hey, you have the option to be anti-capitalist, or like there are these other things. They're strictly being taught things, and they're never, and literally some of these people must be given the opportunity. So what I wonder is like, as a movement, how can we get involved with those sorts of populations? I just realized that I'm giving a lecture, so I don't need to raise my hand. Um, no, actually, here's a, here's a really good example for UVU, and I encourage anyone here to do it. Um, uh, ASL, um, people who are deaf or hearing impaired, um, I think that there's a lot of people on campus who are like that. I mean, so much so that we actually have you know, ASL phones. I think that would be a great demographic to reach out to. I don't have any particular experience with that. What we would have to do is find out what are the difficulties for them that they're experiencing. Um, and let me actually kind of give an example uh, with a group that I worked with. We had two different languages in that, in that group. And so rather than split it and be like, oh, there's the minority, the ghettoized minority you know, language there, and then there's the you know, good English speaking language there. Uh, what we did is we had translators, and we actually just had people translate uh, every every four four sentences about. And so we would just have someone speak English, and then we have somebody speak Spanish, and then somebody speak English, and then somebody speak Spanish. And when somebody in Spanish had something to say, they said it. They translated it to the group. If you know the group had uh, something to respond to, they would do that. Um, that would be the model for for people with the severe abilities like that. That would be the model I think we would take. We would have to have translators. Um, and, you know, again, if you can have someone with ASL here, or you do ASL, you should reach out to them. But just like I can't talk to the Korean students in Korean, um, we need to grow and build our movement, which means also getting into connections where somebody who is taking ASL, or somebody who is interested and sees and emails us, and then tells us, oh, well, I want to do something. I want to be a translator. That is the way in which we're going to be able to grow with that. 
but it also depends on having that actual capacity to do so. At least that was mine. Uh, yes, Chris. Um, as much as I think changing, or sharing ideas and changing mistaken ideas to correct ideas is a, a vital part of a revolutionary movement, um, and this, this will probably come up as a criticism, and I'll just place it as, as a, in context. With feminism, um, and you argue against this all the time, do you think there's an actual time in which that should be done? Because it, uh, I can give at least a couple months instances of when that, of when like of first meeting somebody, that's usually the first thing that comes up is his criticisms of feminism. Or do you think it's important to actually get them going into a movement first, rather than just criticizing the mistaken ideas? Well, I mean that's that's a real question. Um, the, the the question is also this: Well, what are they doing? What do they want to be doing? Um, and why do they hold their position? Uh, I I do I ruthlessly critique feminism. Um, Angela Davis, uh, probably one of the only "quote unquote" feminists, although you know, obviously, arguably not not feminist in the traditional discourse, um, that I actually approve of. Um, but here's the thing: you know, what, you know what else I do? I ruthlessly critique capitalism. I ruthlessly critique liberalism. I ruthlessly critique identity politics when I first run into people, especially if I think those ideas are mistaken or, and are connected. What kind of feminism are we talking about? Now, the feminism I, by and large, run into um, is usually an awful mishmash of bad second wave and bad third wave feminism. And it's used as, as an excuse, I believe, uh, for remaining inactive. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the RSU has a women's committee, and it's very important. And the reason why it's very important is because they are attempting to work on actual women's issues. Simply asserting oneself as a feminist. And actually, to, to put this, I also ruthlessly critique communists when I first meet them. Um, especially if I believe communism or their type of communism is a, a screen, essentially, to do little or to do nothing. In this case, if they're going to engage me as an equal, um, and criticize my position, which usually happens. Or, uh, and by criticize, I don't mean like an anti-criticism, like that's dumb, but you know, give their reasons why they don't agree. Um, then I think it's condescending to me not to do so as well. My, my, my statement is not that it's, it's more of an issue of timeliness. Um, and it seems to me that you create antagonism sometimes, something that maybe natural through criticism, I guess, is that sometimes these, again, feminists who may even see them Additionally, well-meaning, you know, they're interested in Planned Parenthood struggles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oftentimes, I think you develop antagonisms where I think there should have been an antagonism in the first place. And rather than um, working on um, the sort of mistaken ideas to actually see if they're willing to actually work first and work with them on that minimal level, but at the same time, later on, obviously, these discussions should be had. So you see it as an issue of timeliness. Um, I don't. Without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary practice. Um, as a side note, I mean, this is this is sort of the thing. This is also a perspective I take, which I take towards everyone. Um, if you ex uh, ascribe yourself some radical ideology, be it feminism, be it black nationalism, uh, be it communism, be it anarchism, and you're not already doing things, um, then you've already got a problem. And the criticism of your, uh, your critique, or the criticism of your position, is not untimely. Because ostensibly, you have been reading these radicals uh, for quite some time. And if, if you're not already engaged in action, then that critique should not be antagonistic to you. How is it antagonistic to say, I believe your position is wrong for X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C? Um, unless the position is sacrosanct and they're not willing to get involved. Because usually with any critique, it's we also have meetings, we also have this committee, and this is what they're doing. And interestingly enough, plenty of feminists I critique are more than happy to get involved when they, because they actually care about the work. And interestingly enough, um, my particular perspective on it is not overdetermined. It's not the sole perspective. Now, when it becomes the case 
that the position is supposed to be just respected because it's a minority position, um, then yeah, we have big problems. But also, my critique of feminism, especially uh, a feminism that doesn't do anything, and doesn't want to do anything, and doesn't have any concrete past doing anything, um, or feminists specifically, there's no reason there's no reason to believe that that critique doesn't come from a position of respect, and also there's no reason to believe that they haven't already had time. Just like any white anarchist that I have critiqued hasn't already had time to get moving, essentially. This is, uh, I'll just make this the last thing. Um, you mentioned at the beginning, though, when you know, a woman will say something, in her, I mean, let's just say the RCB, like you said, and then that everybody around the room will go and ruthlessly criticize that position rather than sort of offering, well, what do you think this is going to do? How do you think this is advantageous? What are the practical um, logistics for that? Um, don't you think that approach, instead of just beginning with the ruthless criticism, um, be like, okay, well, you're a feminist, what do you want to do? If you're an anarchist, what sort of organizational work do you do? Do you think that would be a more, less antagonistic approach? Because again, I'm not making the uh, excuse that it's a minority position, it should be respected just because it's a minority position. I'm saying getting people motivated to come to RSU or these sorts of things might begin with, what are you doing? This is what we're doing. You should come check out what we're doing. And then upon the next time, it's like, well, Again, upon first meeting of people, I've seen um, just ruthless criticisms come out first. So. Right, but of course ruthless criticisms mean other position. Right. Okay. But <laughs> what I say is, again, like, it creates antagonisms, and again, like, this is where it becomes less inclusive towards people, which ostensibly would be one of the main tenets of the discussion, is how we create an inclusive environment for people. But again, not in this sort of paternalistic, oh, we're just a you know, you're doing sort of thing. Yeah, well, and also it's worth noting in most of those positions, um, it is white liberal feminists, that are actually the majority in those positions. Um, yes, there are RSU instances uh, where people have given, given lectures, lectures on feminism. A lecture on feminism is something a little bit different from just making the voice heard. You're giving a lecture. People want to know what your position is, what the implications of your position are, what the critiques of your position are. If it's just a discussion, that would be one thing. But if you're coming in with a position of authority, then that's a little bit different. And if, again, as a matter of fact, um, the, the criticisms of feminism, if they are ruthless, they are only so theoretically. And the question then is, what is being done for women are not for women in the sense that they are, they need to have things done, but for, oh, what is advancing the uh, women's struggle? That's a different question than what is advancing, or you know, oh well, what do you want to do with your feminism? Because that is usually where it goes, or a lot of times that's been where it goes. And all I, all I, I usually the very first question I ask is, well, what does feminism mean to you, and where do you think that's going? Like, what do you see feminism doing? And that's usually where it leads into the ruthless critique, but yes. Actually, I think that kind of covers my question. I was just going to kind of more say, like, oh, well, don't you, you know, like, um, some of these situations, as opposed to, like, being like, oh, so you're a feminist? Oh, well, feminism's wrong because of this and this and this. Instead, like, kind of, like, kind of like you just said, like, okay, well, uh, what actually do you think of that? Like, what do you, what do you mean about this? And I think, uh, because if you start with like feminism's wrong because it's you know just helping out like you know white rich women, it's, uh, <clears throat> instead you say like okay well what do you mean by that? And if they say oh like you might find that there's like actual common ground there, and you can say like oh well, that's great like you know point out different so different socialist movements that have actually you know achieved those goals and things like that, as opposed to just critiquing this kind of abstract word that might not mean exactly what they mean. Yeah, usually the, the question that I, I, I ask is, um, what, what is, what does that lead you to do? So what actions are you doing? And there are plenty of women that I've run into that they do have actions that they're actually doing. Um, whereas, generally speaking, around the coffee shop, um, among pro predominantly middle class uh, white women, it actually doesn't mean doing anything. And in fact, um, Probably the best feminist I know uh, is actually a woman of color who 
is constantly involved in action and has almost no theoretical background, um, but again, is actually doing things. But and that's uh, that's fine. But I mean, like, um, I mean, a lot of like, uh, say, feminists that might come to the RSU or something like that. Maybe they're not active uh, at that point, but you know, a lot of people aren't active until they find an organization that's doing work that they want to get involved with, and uh, they might, in fact, be coming to say the RSU because they're looking for an organization that might be engaged in the kind of work that they're interested in. If their first impression, which first impressions are extremely important, is like, oh, if this is a group, you know, where there's this dude telling me that feminism is wrong, like, and that's just their first impression of it, it might turn them off as opposed to like seeking first common ground, then the criticism. I think. Um, I'm just gonna clarify because I guess I didn't. So your question, I guess, was how to have this. I guess a conversation like your experience is you've seen it get antagonistic. Like, uh, try to crit criticize feminists, and so I guess was that your question of how to have that? Because I kind of just didn't understand. I guess the cut question. of my question was the timeliness of when to bring up the criticisms. Not so much. I mean, the, the how to is also really important, but also the timeliness of it. Uh, again, as Josh was sort of pointing out, on, on first impression, like because yeah, women, 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 like women. I, I, okay, I'm not going to speak for women. I'm going to say my experience of dealing with people is that. Um, People who critique feminism it usually comes off as very, you know, patriarchal and sort of this sort of thing. And again, like it, it, regardless of the well reasoning of the arguments, it's somehow how people just take it. So uh, don't be correct me if I'm wrong, because again, I'm not going to speak for women, <laughs> at least how I know. Um, but again, it's the timeliness of when to do it, and then obviously the how-to question is also important. So well, for me, this also goes back to what Greg was talking about before: is and the critique's important like you were saying, but it's critique and I think an ability to engage with that individual. So then it, sometimes I would say that if you're just, for a man to critique a woman, then it just brings up all these things and you can have that engagement. And then, yeah, just my side note that it's interesting that the feminism is now kind of being targeted in a room full of man, men, that's all, just my side. Well, well, not I targeted, and I don't mean targeted because I think these things come up with issues of race as well, and issues of ability and those things as well. So. Well, and, and again, the, the ruthless critique extends not only to feminism, but also identity politics in general, Definitely. certain forms of black nationalism. But I mean, again, the critique is also, say, Foucault, right? And whether you can well, have you could do this like every time. No, no, but what I'm saying is you can have, at least as far as I understood it, um, people can have a, a, a critique, a, a strong critique of each other's positions, um, be it Foucault or truth, and what that means. The fact that it's strong doesn't necessarily entail that there's an attack on the person, and it requires a certain level of maturity to understand the attack on the position is not an attack on the person. And that is something incumbent on all of us, that we're all responsible for understanding that. Um, sorry, Jacob. You had a comment and a question, but the question's of a different variety. Um, the comment I would like to forward is that sometimes uh, we're doing, you know, like revolutionary work, and sometimes when you're having conversations with people, especially at school, you're not attacking them as a feminist. In fact, the person may not even be a feminist. They may just be studying feminists and call themselves a feminist, uh, which will sometimes happen. But under certain circumstances, I think it's okay to like be like, oh, I hold this position. And as an academic, you're engaged in an academic conversation. I think what you're talking about here is about, you know, people in the movement, you know, activists, which has a completely different tone and tenor of respectability um, by which, you know, the sort of things that uh, Chris is talking about. Um, so, you know, if you you know, meet a peer, a student peer, or if you're talking with another peer in class, right, and the topic is feminism, it's not inappropriate, I believe, to attack that sort of on an academic scale. I mean, of course we realize that the uh, domination of things like uh, patriarchy and things like that exist in the classroom, so that ought to be respected. But, you know, there are different registers under which different treatments of individuals and things like that need to be taken in terms of talking about ideologies and things like that. 
forms of exclusion and stuff like that. So there's that. Uh, my question was, how do we avoid uh, problems of things like tokenism and things like that in movements? Ruthless critique. That is the most important way. Because, and I was actually going to get into this, one additional thing to keep in mind is the actual pragmatics, which I didn't touch on. Critical thinking. Critical thinking is not something that we all have. It's, some, it's a skill. It's built and it's developed. Emotional maturity is not simply, and, and this is something super important, because this is a really important distinction that I think primarily men need to get over, although I've seen people who are minorities, uh, or uh, racial or ethnic minorities also do. You need to have the emotional maturity to know when somebody is attacking your position and to know when someone is attacking you. Because both require different responses and they do require responses. When someone is attacking you in a way because you are a minority, that is something fundamentally different from them attacking your position. And I've actually, I've seen both. I've seen people who are attacked because they're women. No other reason, they, they have just as good a reasoning as any of their male peers. They have just as good of positions, just as good of ideas, but they're constantly and consistently attacked by their uh, male counterparts, essentially just because they're women. They're not given a fair treatment. And what they internalize is that it's just critique. That it's just, oh, I'm being critiqued. Oh, I need to get better. Oh, people don't agree with me. That's unacceptable. You absolutely, when you are being attacked for being a woman, when you are attacked for being Latino, when you are being attacked for being gay, you need to point that out and call them out on that. But then the flip side is, you also need to know when you're being attacked or your position is being attacked. And the best way to do that is to give anyone in the movement, but I, I perhaps even spend additional time uh, with minorities, building critical reasoning skills and out of that emotional maturity so that they can begin asserting themselves in the movement strongly and fighting for their position. Uh, asserting their position, arguing for their position, defending their position, so that others understand it, or, or perhaps even more than that, explaining their position, because usually that is enough. But then also knowing when they're being attacked as a minority, and calling that out, um, because that is not acceptable, and that needs to be combated as well. And so these are the ways that you avoid tokenism is you build in people the ability so that they have real leadership. And again, that also comes back to responsibility. Once people are able to defend their position and argue for it, um, and explain things to people and talk to people, they'll be able to take on more and more responsibilities, just as everyone would, whether they're minority or not. Um, and as they build their ability to take responsibilities, they will be able to then have a position of leadership. Does that answer your question? Um, kind of. I, when I think of tokenism, I'm thinking more along the lines of, of promoting individuals inside of an organization, not on their merits, but rather their sort of minority status. You know, AKA Michael Steele and the Republican Party or Sarah Palin, you know. I'm sorry, I can only come up with Republican examples. I'm sure there are other examples as well and Barack other Obama. parties. Right, uh, Barack Obama, precisely. Uh, what, there are black Democrats? <laughs> there weren't black presidents before. Um, but, you know, I mean, like, uh, again, one might even accuse uh, the Democrats of using tokenism. But that's what I was kind of thinking about tokenism. And I'm kind of, I'm not worried about this particular movement, but I wanted your comments on how it is that one could be meritorious, but also realize the, the sort of the sensitivities and the ways under which, you know, patriarchy or sexism or heteronormativity, you know, can affect, it basically, can, can you maybe parse out when it is that one is engaging in tokenism versus rather than just genuinely promoting individuals who are, you know, good leaders? Sure. You are promoting tokenism when you don't critically analyze their position 
and they can have whatever position they want, um, and it doesn't matter because they're just filling up that place. Look at Michael Steele. Look at Sarah Palin. Uh, the sort of shit that they say doesn't really correlate to anything. It doesn't even particularly correlate well to the Republican Party. They're just there because they want a particular colored face or a particular gender there. So when they're not, they're not treated as adults, and their positions aren't treated as adults. That's one way in which there's tokenism. The other is they don't have any responsibility. They're never held responsible for anything. Yeah, Michael Steele lost his position way later than he should have. The Republican Party is ruthless about message. Absolutely ruthless. And careers have been destroyed for less than what Michael Steele did in his first month. And yet, he persisted through his entire chairmanship. Why? Because they weren't willing to hold him responsible for anything. And moreover, when people actually criticized him, um, you know, it, w it was actually taken as a sort of racism. It was taken as not, you know, respecting him because he's black. Barack Obama has a very interesting, interesting dialectic. Um, it, the Republicans are so evil that almost anyone can make an argument for justifying the Democrats. I'm not saying I agree with it. Obviously, I don't. Part of the revolutionary students. That's a party line, you know, you can vote Democrat, whatever. Um, so there's that aspect, but there's also the aspect to which anything like Barack, any critiques of Barack Obama often are construed as racism. Um, now, there are some that are clearly racist, like he's a Kenyan Muslim, and even if he was, that, that would somehow matter. Um, but, for example, people who criticize his invasion of Libya are said to be racist because they would allow white people to do that. And oftentimes the people criticizing them are the same people who criticize Bush for invading Iran, or, or, or uh, sorry, Iraq. Um, not for lack of trying. Right, so again, when the position is not respected in order to be analyzed, and when no one's held responsible for anything, that's tokenism. Um, and you can end. So, is it past? Or? Um. I guess I would, I mean, I don't know if it's a, I was just thinking as well because you're talking about how um, to, I guess, encourage people to assert their position in the movement and how the ability to critically think, and I think some of the difficulty is with these things we're talking about is um, with being the minority is the internalization. And so, of those, so then when you are critiqued, you're not. I'm trying to say this. Um, I, I just think as well, there's a lot of work to be done to then, I guess, think how you've internalized, you know, like how I've internalized issues of sexism, or how I, or how someone else has, and then, so that ability, I guess, to be able to assert your position and, and then, the need, I guess, of you know your allies and people within the movement to do that, but I don't. Know, I have more to say. But I kind of lost my thought with all that. So yeah, I mean that's one of the big. It's not just no. It's not just you know encouraging people to speak up. That's more of a whole lifetime of like subject making and subjectivity that goes into this, and this is why these things are operating in society in our so powerful and difficult to shake, so. Yeah, well, I mean, that is certainly true, and I don't mean to denigrate that at all. Um, but also, it's amazing how much you can break that if you actually make the effort to do so. No, I mean, I agree, or I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting here if not, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the UVU, or, or UVU RSU is actually pretty, pretty racist and patriarchal, because we have two white men and a white woman. But it is Utah County, so, you know. Not for lack of trying. The U of U RSU, um, which is another organization that I, I have been involved with, but I don't obviously have any say in, has a Chicano woman as its head, has a woman as its vice president, and its initial secretary was actually a homosexual man. And the only reason he's not the secretary anymore is because commitments didn't you know, fall through. And these people actually do stuff. They actually are responsible for things, and they follow through. 
Um, which, it's funny that, our, and it is an incredibly patriarchal society, but it's funny that just, not just, but putting women in positions of power helps empower them and really cut down on the amount of sexism that they're willing to put up with. That putting people who are uh, gay in positions of power where they, they can make real decisions um, really cuts down in, you know, their exploitation and the positions of power uh, and that internalization. Because again, going back to what I very, very first thing I said, the only way to build minority leadership is through minority leadership. And that's, there's no, I mean, I can offer suggestions, but there's no easy path. It's going to be different with every single person, every single organization, every single situation. But I hope that this helps, at least in some way, answer some of those questions. I really like point number two of respect, you know? Because as a minority, you know, I can see, you know, how specifically take away a, a paternalistic attitude, you know, and condescending attitude too, you know? Because if you are like, they say, brave enough to like criticize me, you know, and I can hold my position, you treat me as an equal, basically. You know? We're talking, and through that, you can find like, you can find a lot of things in common with the other person. And like a different student, you say, you know? we're talking about Angela Davis, you know. I mean, you can, to, you can criticize her, you know, and you probably not agree with black nationalism, you know. But you can find, you can find in her life the way that she, she, she thinks, you know, a lot, a lot of like important things, you know. She was like, for example, um, really critical to white male society in general, really critical to white feminists, you know, and the approach to uh, minority women, you know. But she also was really critical to her own party, you know for the Chauvinistic army to a lot of the uh, Black Panther members, you know? So you can, to critical analysis, you can basically be surprised at how you, the past number of things you can discover, basically, you know? I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding because Angela Davis is one of the few that I actually support and like would agree with like 95% yeah, of what she true. said. Um, but, but also, the black nationalism I don't agree with is, say, um, Nation of Islam. You know, I, I don't agree with the Nation of Islam. Or at least not close, not the max. Um, no, no, but what is, that's what I'm trying to say. Like you, yeah. you can totally disagree with black nationalism, but you can totally see her point of, her point of view and be like, really surprised. Like, okay, she's a member of the Black Party Party, she supports the, the party policies, but I think that she's really critical about the attitude of a lot of the members of the Black Panther Party, especially the male members, you know, because the attitude was really like male center, you know, really chauvinistic too, you know. Yeah, I mean, to sort of, we've been talking overly about the, the critical, the critical aspect without maybe substantiating, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Respond, or critically analyze has two aspects, right, or two outcomes. One is, and the one, it's the one we've been talking about, because con you're, this is how I see it. Condescending white liberal attitudes are the number one thing that I see as really among progressive movements, stopping minority leadership. So of course I'm pushing hard on that. But to critically analyze, right, means to approach it with an open mind. Which means, just as you said, you very well could end up agreeing with a lot of it. Um, you know, you can very much, at least I can, very much agree with a lot of what Angela Davis says. I can agree very much with what a lot of um, uh, Franz Fanon says. Um, you know, I could go. I could go down the whole list. But so yeah, your point is well taken. One is you need to get rid of the condescending attitude by criticizing it. But then second, we should also keep in mind critically or not criticizing, critically analyzing it. Critically analyzing it means there's also should be the possibility that you could change your mind. Right, so not simply just criticizing or finding everything you can criticize in the position. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to mention the Democratic Party is uh, suboptimal. Uh, yeah. Or something. Yeah, the old Black Panthers were much, much better. Yes. Although deeply imperfect and also deeply, uh, deeply chauvinistic, yeah, so especially, <laughs> especially their leadership. Um, like, you know, even the old leadership embraced the new Black Panther Party. Yeah. Yeah, right. 
Yeah, well, and I mean, again, they weren't, they weren't perfect. And I'm not, it's not to whitewash that. Um, but also there was a lot of, there were a lot of problems. And now they were dealing with those issues, not in the most advanced sort of way. But now we know the problems that did arise out of that. And it's, we have no excuse. Um, if there is violence towards women or sexual abuse in our organizations, um, those people should be removed. Um, you know, that would be holding people responsible. So. I think she had her hand up. Oh, sorry, I was just working my back a little. Um, Emily? When you, when you say holding people responsible, in what ways do we do that toward one another? How do we hold one another responsible more than saying, like, um, like reminding people like when certain things are supposed to be accomplished or finished? It all depends on the level of appropriateness. Um, just for the record, not that, or I mean, Chris mentioned it earlier. Uh, I didn't write the uh, International League of Filipino Struggles. I was supposed to write that last week. I didn't write it last week. I wrote it this week. Um, it wasn't a big deal because we, uh, at least I don't think it was a big deal because we all had a lot of shit to do. And so it was like, oh, here's this, you know, statement. It didn't get sent out the week that it could have gone sent out. I guess we'll send out another week. You know, it's appropriate, it's appropriate to, for me to say, I should have done that, I totally forgot, and now it's done, and I shouldn't do that in the future. And you should criticize me for forgetting about it. Uh, if somebody rapes someone in the RSU, then they should probably be expelled from the organization, and people should be like, uh, you know what, we're not having that. Um, you know, that's not okay. Or. Um, you know, if someone is constantly uh, harassing someone for being Latino or being a woman or being gay, or if someone is uh, making weird sexual overtures towards people, smothers. What? Smut. Oh, um, <laughs> then they should be strongly criticized and they should be told constantly that that's not okay and that, you know, uh, we, we don't like that in our organization. And when they do action like that, we should sharply criticize them publicly for it. But again, it's a level of appropriateness. All we can have are general guidelines. There's no hard and fast rule. because At least I don't think there's a hard and fast rule because I'm a materialist. It's going to depend on the situation. Now, if the RSU was leading an armed revolution in the Philippines, and we needed to build unity with a revolutionary group that, you know, anti-imperialist group in the Philippines in order to get supplies, and I didn't send out, you know, a statement, that'd be a big deal. I mean, it would not just, it's already a big deal. It would be a huge deal, and, you know, we're talking about something absolutely serious, but it's always going to be a case-by-case -case basis. We have general rules, and we do the best with the reality we're presented. Is that? Yeah. Josh? On the back. Um, I'm not sure how relevant my, my question is to the conversation, but a little, go, a little while ago we were talking about national liberation. You were talking about how you didn't support certain uh, groups that were for national liberation. Uh, I mean, but don't you think it's kind of the case that you're in the United States, like with these different colonized nations, such as the black nation, that the primary, so to say, the con primary con uh, contradiction is that these are colonized nations, and that any, uh, regardless of like, uh, the nation of Islam's patriarchy, like the thing is, is that uh, the black nation has the right to self determination, and any groups that are working towards that self determination need to be supported in that, in, at least in that goal, while still uh, be, uh, critiquing their their patriarchal uh, views. Sure. Okay. I mean, that's a more qualified position. I support the nation of Islam insofar as it is fighting for black liberation. I do not support the nation of Islam. Insofar as women are not treated as equals, I do not support the Nation of Islam. Um, insofar as gays, uh, LGBTQ people are not treated uh, with equality. And of course, I, I do have a side note, which is what created these conditions? Well, that would be global imperialism and global capitalism and the need to divide the working class. Nevertheless, those sorts of behaviors are not something that I would encourage. I mean, I would encourage national liberation. I would encourage black nationalism. But the group doesn't get a, a full pass 
except in that the atrocities of the United States are so much worse that anything that is fighting against that we, we have and we should, I believe, support. Um, but again, I'm not going to hold them up as you know what we should be striving for within the revolutionary movement and what sort of leadership we should be attempting to cultivate in the revolutionary movement. But yeah, okay, you know, again, insofar as it fights white American racism, it's good. Insofar as it reproduces um, American imperialist patriarchy, it's bad. You know, like, not terribly controversial. No. I was just clarifying because yeah. you don't support the nation of Islam. And, that, yeah. and it, is, it seems like two different Actually, uh, believe it or not, my my next question was uh, along the line of Josh's. Um, to what extent do minorities who are engaging in nationalistic struggles um, have a voice that uh, maybe uh, other people that are in dominant majorities and things like that, uh, such as colonizers, ought to uh, concede or at least make concessions to um, they are different views, even if we perhaps disagree with them. Do you get, do you get what I'm asking? Yeah. Uh, to what extent can uh, an oppressed minority have a view such that even if we disagree sharply with that view, we still should, not can, but should concede to that view because of some, some sort of uh, overwhelming evidence or overwhelming demand on us, such as colonization or right. imperialism? That, that's part of it, but also there's a sense of inclusion in which, you know, um, like, uh, say for instance, uh, the immigrant community here, like in Utah, to a certain extent will be more aware of its own problems and its own needs, as opposed to, say, an organization of, like, white patriarchal people in Utah County, or something like that. Not that I'm saying the RSU is insensitive towards those people. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying to what extent should that organization kind of like concede what it is that, say, for instance, they want to do as being superior because they're part of that community and we are not part of that community. Do you, yeah. do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. What I would say is, again, ruthless critique. And the other thing I would say is um, self-determination. So, as a matter of fact, as long as it's not infringing on self-determination, then the other group can do whatever it wants. Um, and again, there's a lot of there's a lot of presuppositions there. Do do people in minority communities necessarily have a better view? I don't think they do. That's not to say that um, people who are not part of minorities have a better view. That is to say that the only way of determining the actual better view is through dialogue, discussion, and debate about it. So, insofar as the minor, or the, the group, I mean, uh, I'm not an immigrant, but I hear this all the time from a lot of immigrants. Um, you know, we just have to, we have to sacrifice everything else that we're doing for the sake of our families. And that means fighting these laws. We, we've got we've to make a deal with the governor. Okay, that's a position. That's a position they're certainly entitled to have, and I'll respect that position. I also have the position that we won all of these immigrant rights in the 60s, and now they're gone. They're slipping away, decade by decade, year by year. And the only way to get rid of them is by getting rid of capitalism. Now, I'm willing to hear a rejoinder against that. Uh, what I'm not willing to do is to pretend just because they are part of the immigrant community that their position is essentially correct. But how will we determine that? Discussion. As a side note, I actually know several people in the immigrant community, several people even in the undocumented community, who say, you know what, you're right. Um, you know, I never knew what communism was, uh, but now I know I'm a communist. Because if we don't stop the system, all of this is going to happen all over again. Just 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So, to answer your question, the only way we defer, we should defer, is we're not interfering with their sovereignty, and we have a principal discussion on that. Now, here's the thing, the immigrant community is like, I want to form our, my own party that doesn't include your views, they should be allowed to do so. 
or rather not that they should be allowed to do so, we should not interfere in their ability to do so. If they want to have a coalition that's just about getting the governor, then we should let them do it. We shouldn't bother them. If they think that's their best strategy of defense, then so be it. Just like the Nation of Islam. I don't agree with the Nation of Islam. Um, I don't agree with the new uh, Brown Berets. Um, they want to do their thing, fine. I'm not going to interfere with them to do their thing. Um, but also, I'm not going to agree with their view just because it's their view and they're a minority. Does that help clarify? Yeah. Okay. All right. Any additional questions, comments, scathing, or ruthless critiques? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope this was helpful in some way.